From KPBS and PRX, you are listening to Port of Entry, a podcast by and for people who cross the U.S.-Mexico border. I got the opportunity to come and work in Mexico, and I haven't left since. I am producer Kinsey Moreland, and today we've got a bonus episode for you. Hi. How are you? you? Drew. Alan. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you, too. A few weeks ago, the Port of Entry crew took a quick trip down to Valle de Guadalupe, That is the beautiful wine region that's a 90-minute drive south from the U.S.-Mexico border in Tijuana. And we met up with Drew Deckman. He's a chef and a pretty big deal in the culinary world, in part because his food is really good, but also because he's a leader in restaurant sustainability. He sources almost all of his food locally, only cooks over wood-fired ovens, and otherwise tries to make environmentally friendly choices. The restaurant Drew runs in the Valle is named Deckman's. And it is a mostly outdoor spot that opened 13 years ago after Drew sort of fell in love with this huge pine tree in the middle of a ranch and vineyard in the Valle. Drew says the minute he saw that tree, he knew that this then pretty remote, empty valley was where he wanted his restaurant to grow. And I keep wondering, is this the tree? No. No. Oh, the tree, I need the tree. No, it's the pine tree. That's okay, inside. I didn't think it was that one. That's now inside the restaurant. Okay. Oh, that's, that's the that's, famous tree. Okay. That's, that's sort of where we started. Okay. Because we didn't have any walls or anything. It was just a grill and like 30 seats. Wow. And now we have more, more than that. Yes, <laughs> a, a little bit more than that. So our friends over at KPBS TV recently aired a new hour-long special about Drew. So what we tried to do is we tried to bring the table to the farm as opposed to the farm to the table. And so when they say, what's the most important thing in the kitchen? You go, well, it's three things. It's ingrediente, ingrediente, ingrediente. Ingrediente is actually the name of that hour-long TV special about Drew. And the show's producer, Jill Bond, met up with us in Valle, too. And after talking with him, I presented this idea to PBS that what if we could show the valley in Drew's eyes? So we started filming the series, and then the pandemic hit. So, yeah, what was meant to be a shiny, happy show about the culinary explosion that's happening in the Valle right now, it morphed into this incredibly personal story about how Drew weathered the storm that the pandemic brought down so hard on restaurants. When the world shut down, it wasn't a gradual kind of trickling off. It was, we had a completely full restaurant the two months before, and then literally from a Monday to a Saturday, like all the reservations like canceled, day. like night and day, like somebody turned off a faucet. We'll get into how Drew handled that dramatic change after a quick break. Do not touch that digital dial. The KPBS Explore Local Content Project is looking for talented producers to create local content that reflects our diverse community and embraces the public media storytelling spirit. Every two years, KPBS opens a call for the next big content idea. The Explore 2022 call for submissions is underway. We're looking for ideas of all kinds, especially podcasts. Submit your application online through September 1st at kpbs.org explore. And we are back. So real quick, a little bit more about Valle de Guadalupe, because the first time I drove through the valley on the Ruta del Vino, as they call it, was a little more than a decade ago. Back then, it was still this really remote rural spot. Not much was really going on. It was a mix of a few really nice high-end wineries and these tiny mom-and-pop shops. Like, I remember literally walking into this sweet old man's cozy little house, tasting a few of his homemade wines, and then once I picked the one I liked most, the old man pulled a blank wine bottle off his shelf, put a piece of masking tape on it, and hand-wrote the name of the wine in the year he made it. 
The whole thing was charming and beautiful, and that drive through the Valle is absolutely hands down one of my favorite all-time experiences. Nowadays, though, well, the Valle is nearly unrecognizable to people like me who haven't kept up with its explosive growth over the last decade. Millennials are flocking there to a valley with vineyards as far as the eye can see. Today's adventure is a trip to the wine country called Valle de Guadalupe. Today we are in Valle de Guadalupe, which is actually in Mexico. We made it to Valle de Guadalupe. So excited. Bienvenidos Valle de Guadalupe. Guadalupe. Long gone are the days of the Valle feeling like one of the best kept secrets in the world. There are tons of new restaurants and wineries, dozens of high-end hotels, and a few newish nightclubs. There's even a place offering up helicopter tours of the Valley. The New York Times has written about it, along with pretty much every other food writer worth their salt. And pepper. <laughs> you know, because food? Anyway, the rapidly changing character of the Valle is just one of the topics covered in our conversation with Drew and Jill. So let's get to it. Here is our host, Alan Lilienthal, asking Drew, who grew up in the States, about why and how he ended up south of the border. What was your relationship to Mexico before really coming? Like, what, what is it about this place that you think made you feel so at home? I've always grown up you know, intrigued by Mexico. I spent a couple of summers in the Yucatan Peninsula when I was in high school, back when I still believed in organized religion. Basically, a bunch of high school kids went down to Yucatan and built churches and houses, and, and it was, uh, we had, you had the option of dining in the home of one of the villagers, or there was a cantina made for, and I always ate in these huts in the middle of the jungle, and I think I was the only student on the trip that gained weight. I just couldn't get enough of everything. And it was just like, wow. You know, everybody else got sick from eating in the canteen. I never got sick. And and it was just like, wow. And and I just always had been fascinated with the ingredients and the flavors. I remember in my little town, a restaurant in where I grew up, which is like a regular, you know, Georgia small town Mexican restaurant, but it was really good for my standards back then. And I remember going, because I had a couple other like chef friends, we'd go and we'd always ask to eat what the staff had eaten that day, as opposed to ordering off the menu. Just always with that sort of desire for those flavors. And then I got the opportunity to come and work in Mexico and I haven't haven't left since. So So like Drew, Jill Bond, the producer of the TV special, spends most of her time in Mexico. She and her husband actually have a house in Valle right down the road from Drew's place. Okay, back to Alan asking Jill about why she wanted to focus her lens on Drew. What are the origins of Ingrediente? Is it it like going to be an ongoing series of different ingredients and chefs who use them? Or was it specifically just this one-off on Yes, so we, you know, the the idea this all came about was when uh, I met Drew. We were doing a a documentary on the region, the valley, because it's, it's been growing so much. And I was interviewing all the different chefs just because there's so much happening and it's a very exciting time and and met Drew and you know he's a Mexican himself he's American born Michelin star chef and after talking with him um, I presented this idea to PBS that what if we could show the valley in Drew's eyes so we started filming the series and then the pandemic hit and obviously we had to pivot and figure out what we were going to do and we were quarantined here. Aja and I, my husband, live here part-time most of the time. And I was like, Drew, can we come and hang out with you? <laughs> Would you mind if we stopped by the restaurant every day? Because he fed his staff every single day, four people of his staff, their families. He also fed 200 fishermen every single week. And so he was here and a very limited staff were here cooking every single day. And I thought, well, let's just put the cameras on. Uh, Didn't have a a team, but we had ourselves and started with the iPhone. And then we thought we would do some Instagram stories. But anyway, we had a good time and we were just hanging out. And then I was watching unfold 
the experience of almost every restaurateur, what they must be going through. There was cautious optimism in the beginning, and then it turned into maybe a little bit of desperation, and then it turned into the one scene where he just, you know, is done. And then it comes back to the rebirth and the whole hero's journey. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's what we captured, and I think it's a beautiful story. Yeah, it was it was interesting because basically when the world shut down, the really very short amount of time prior to that, it wasn't a gradual kind of you know trickling off. We had a completely full restaurant the two months before, and then literally from a Monday to a Saturday, like all the reservations like canceled, night like night and day. Like somebody turned off a faucet, and we just sort of watched the reservations go down. And the government had not really done anything. The government wasn't saying anything. The government wasn't really giving any indications. And so when I saw that, I was like, look, we just need, we need to stop. We need to be an example and just shut it down. It was 23rd of March, but March, April, May, June, you know, we're going into the high season. So we grow about 90% of all of our vegetables that we serve in the restaurant. So I have three farms that produce for us. And the 23rd of March, those farms were full and ready and just overflowing with everything that we had planted to get ready for high wow. season. So what do you do with the food, right? When we closed, we had uh, you know a walk-in cooler full of proteins because the purchase was made for the week and then all of a sudden the world shuts off. And so it's like, all right, well, you know, how do we at least put this nourishment into somebody's body as opposed to trash? So that's when we, we started to do the, the food for staff. And then a local fish distributor here, uh, Hamat, came to us and it's like, look, we have this idea. We've got a lot of people that are willing to, to donate proteins. You've got your garden. You know, let's let's do some good. And I, I guess kind of in the end, there's, there's only two kinds of people in the world, right? The ones that run away from fires and the ones that run toward fires. Uh, I mean, I don't think there's much in between. And so we were in a position where we were able to run toward the fire. I think we helped uh, a lot of people during the time. It's incredible, yeah. That is an incredible and very well put. But I do think there's another kind of person, I have to say. The the people who just, people who just watch, fi watch the fires like, watch. with their iPhones, just like, right? yeah, they're not is. running, they're not hey, they're just like, <laughs> <laughs> That is the reality. So we've got to document the story, right? Yeah, yeah. Um... Yesterday we closed, we closed Deckman's, um, and so today we're packing. Uh, still have quite a few of the team members here today. Uh, that'll diminish, start going down. Uh, today we're packing up the entire restaurant, putting it away, essentially, not leaving anything out here. We, we don't know how long this is gonna last. Our restaurant family, it's 50 families that most of them are married and have children. Extend that out and you know, you start talking about 200 people that live on a daily basis here from the restaurant. So what I've promised uh, our team is that every day we're gonna cook uh, a family meal, that each one of them has, uh, has the right to take up the food for four people. We're gonna cook for staff as long as we can. Uh, we've contacted uh, our ranchers and our, our purveyors and everybody wants to help. Curious if this the, the the tradition that was born of the pandemic, where you like feed the staff and their families, like how is that continuing? Is how how did that change the vibe of? I'm sure that changes the culture of how the the workers relate to you and each other. We always provide a family meal every day for all the staff, but it, when we're open, it's only for that person that's here. So what we did when we closed, now everybody's out of a job. Their their spouse is out of a job. So we prepared food for them to take home with them for up to four people per employee. So they can now guarantee every day they're gonna have a hot meal that they can take home and there's food for the family. Just to sort of take away a little bit of, of the, the worry that everybody had on their shoulders.
when the pandemic hit, a lot of p places in the cities, um, San Diego, LA, did a lot of takeout, and they were able to survive. They were able to really continue their their operations and not do so bad and keep their. They didn't have that opportunity here. Um, so it was, I think, a lot more dramatic for the workers, for the chefs, for the wineries, for all the businesses, because they just didn't have anybody coming in. So the whole place literally shut down. And I just think that was really hard, and I think that probably was likely for almost all tourist vacation spots. But yeah, that was hard to watch. I can imagine. Yeah. It's interesting too because the pandemic has changed the valley pretty dramatically. When we started coming down, let's say 10 years ago, it was quiet, right? There, it was quiet. It was Drew's place. It was a couple of places and, and some wineries. And then five years ago, it became this crazy place. And then two years ago, it became even more crazy. It was van after van and you couldn't, the traffic, it was awful. And then when the pandemic hit, it just stopped. And we were, I just remember being here and like, we were going, my gosh, there's nobody on the road. It's beautiful. It was awesome. <laughs> it, was awesome. <laughs> it wasn't, it wasn't awesome for the businesses, but I also think that it weeded some of the, the businesses out. I don't know. Maybe that's true. Maybe that's not true. I, I don't know for sure, but there's just a lot of different groups coming in here, putting in nightclubs and kind of changing the, the vibe, I think of the Valley. And I, I hope that doesn't continue because that's what makes it so unique and so special is just the quietness of it and being in nature and, and just like we're sitting here right now under these beautiful trees. There's an interesting thing that I don't, I don't know if you're aware of, but he only drew and his people only cook over wood fire. They, that's what they use as their, their source, their power source. So it's just wood, which is really interesting. And their kitchen is completely outside. So um, that's very, very unique. One Thanksgiving, two years ago, the film features Drew cooking in the pouring rain and his entire staff, and that was Thanksgiving night. And I mean, it was pouring. I wasn't going to film that day, and I had a house full of people, I'm ready to you know, sit down, and he's like, calls me and says, get your ass over here. <laughs> this is great awesome. television. <laughs> So I had to leave, my, we had, everyone left. I actually stayed and I sent some people over, my family over, my son, and they wound up filming and it turned out to be really good television. You know, so one of the, the, the really wild things about having an outdoor kitchen, I mean, obviously today we look like we're a swap meet or a flea market with all the tarps and stuff. The wood burns different, the humidity, there's more smoke, there's less temperature, impossible to bake anything. You know, obviously everything has a little bit of rainwater essence in it. The, the flavors change based on whatever's coming off the tree into the pots, right? The cool thing is that the right people come. They know that we can't control the weather. And they know that we're still here doing this, trying as hard as we can. Yeah, you know, it's raining, it's cold, whatever. I think it's cool. Buenas noches, bienvenidos. Gracias por compartir la mesa con nosotros. Well, one of the things this ranch doesn't produce is petroleum products. So we have no natural gas, we have no oil, we have no coal, but what we have is a lot of firewood. So the wood-fired kitchen was born from the desire to stay within the boundaries of the ranch at all costs. Well, yeah, has sustainability, how did that, that part of your... You know, it's, it's always been something important for me. I've been a member of Slow Food since the early 90s. When I was in Europe, uh, all the places where I was an employee, you know, just amazed and blown away by the relationships they had with very, very local producers. And then as I started to take over kitchens as well in Europe, I did the same thing. You know, initially it wasn't necessarily, you know, maybe with the, the sustainability glasses on, more in a, I want the best ingredient available to me and I want to be a good neighbor kind of thing. Almost always it's better if it's growing across the street and f for me it's like how do you not make that decision right it seems so intrinsic to me I don't know if it's because we've done it for 25 years or it's because it just is and and I struggle seeing colleagues still making non-responsible choices because it's a popular ingredient or like bluefin tuna or it's more convenient to call the big box store or the big box purveyor to bring all your stuff as opposed to taking the time to create those relationships with the people that are around you. Mm. 
And that's so much more wholesome. I think of all the things that I love about Valle, which are many, many things, I think this region is very special to my heart. I'm curious as it's growing and it's exploding because Valle really is like, it's a gold mine right now. You really, you, you hear so much of so much growth. I'm sure you think about like, how can you retain that true care for what the, the services that the Valle is providing for people? The growth has been exponential, yeah, obviously, yeah. and not yeah. all positive growth. So really is it, how do you, I, I, we can't stop the growth. Yeah. Maybe we could be a steward, uh, a guide, uh, an example of best practices. Because, you know, here it's basically whoever has the biggest bag of money is going gonna, is gonna to get the, right. the, the zoning that's changed. What or, that's what concerns me. And that's what's happening. But I think if we can sort of continue to have little islands like Rancho Magor and continue to show that, hey, you can grow your own food and you can return most of it to the planet and you can compost and you can recycle your water. And, I mean... Be in as, harmony with the surroundings. Well, yeah, and there, there's just so many restaurants now in the valley. Go fly a drone over the valley. There, there's not that many gardens planted that people say, we're growing our own food. It's just not there. It's like grapes for show. Um, you know, it's like anything else. The number of wineries have increased exponentially here in the area, but the number of producing vineyards, not at the same rate. So where are those grapes coming from? Where is that juice coming from? And there's a million answers to that to that question as we grow up as a valley i mean maybe that's not the right way to say it but as as it continues to change there's obviously a lot that needs to be done to ensure that sort of the essence and the spirit of the valley is is retained even in the face of, of of this growth As the science developed, it took took a while, but um, once people realized, oh, outside is pretty safe, you know, in terms of the virus. I mean, this just seems like such a naturally. Yeah, we had we had no idea in 2012 that we were preparing the perfect <laughs> pandemic restaurant. Well, yeah, yeah, congratulations, yeah, yeah. that's what you have here. So did you channeled you channeled the future? Do you think that? helped you? I think it definitely helped us. I, I think that people felt very comfortable coming back. Uh, we were also very proactive working with the local health department and state health department to develop protocols for when we did reopen. Uh, and we made a lot of changes based on their recommendations. And then they came to us after we had opened. Is it? Do you mind if we document what you've done so we can use it as a reference for other restaurants? Which was cool. It's good, but we took two and a half months as the laws were changing every single day. I mean, nobody really knew where the, the pin was gonna drop, but there was sort of a guide. I mean, you may have to wear gloves, you may not have to wear gloves, you may have to, it, it, was, it was details that were gonna be changing, but the flow of people, occupancy, all of that, really was gonna pretty much be the same. And so we were able, because we're gifted with a lot of space, a meter and a half or six feet between table, we were able to go eight or 10. We were also able to really change the way we did business in the sense of extending opening hours to reduce the number of people that were actually in the space at one time. And, and it worked out really well. And a lot of people have sort of forgotten that there's still a pandemic going on and you go into places and they've stopped most of their protocols and we're still maybe 85% as militant as we have been in the past. We've relaxed a little bit, but still, we're still taking temperatures, we're still writing down where you're coming from and it's all, only reservations so we can control the number of people that are coming in at any one time. Very simple, minimal controls applied to, to people flow. How do you feel when you look out at the restaurant now and see it's busy and people are showing up, right? And it, it feels really good. You know, we obviously had no idea what was going to happen when we reopened. Are people going to be showing up? Obviously, the world's not going back ever to what it was before, at least not for a long time. And for the better, in my opinion. You know, there's a lot of really good things that are even just, uh, you know, a, a refocus on family and in free time uh you know how 
I don't, is is the office space going to be something that's going to be real in the future? We we made it a year and a half. Do you really need to spend that money on a big fancy office? Probably not. You know, so a lot of things are going to start changing. I'm curious how else. I think the pandemic recontextualized a lot of our relationships to the things we love doing. Like, how have your aspirations, your like, your dreams, your visions for the future of this whole thing, or your like of your your craft, how has that been changed? You know, I think probably more than anything, it's sort of reignited some of the passion that I may have had covered with dust. I don't think passion ever dies. I think it just gets sort of covered up with it's like... with like corrosion or something. <laughs> Because we, we were victims of our own growth here in the restaurant. We had gotten to a point where the volume of people that we were doing was more than what was established in my romantic dream image of what this place was. So now I had a disconnect between the sort of cere- the, the cerebral image of what my restaurant was and what the reality was. And I started to feel uncomfortable being in my own space. So I started to go to chef shows and festivals and guest chef and travel and this and that and take on events in other places. And being closed for five months really gave us a chance to deconstruct and reconstruct and deconstruct and over and over again uh, what we have. And when it was reborn, it was way more similar to what we were five years ago than to what we were five months before. And I like being here again. You know, we went from six days open to five days open because my entire team said, God, it's really nice to have a couple of days off. We were working double shifts, everybody, six days a week, and now we do two shifts, two groups of people. Nobody works more than nine hours a day, two days off a week. Now you can do your laundry, go to the bank, and sleep for a whole day. A big part of what what we learned is where do you trim away the excess? Mm. There was so much excess, not only in our staff, our everything we were doing. It was just it was fat, just because we were being very successful. You know, there's a lot of things going on positive, but the result of that was sort of this gout, if you would, from you know excess. Uh, maybe that's that's I kind of like that word. The restaurant had gout, uh, <laughs> Harsh, but okay. but it was it was it sort of got covered up a little bit because of the the volume and the velocity, and so that was just it was a really unbelievable gift from the universe to be able to reset. We've definitely become more efficient. Efficient is probably the word. Mm-hmm. And really, we took the time to to look and and analyze everything we were doing while we were you know we weren't just sitting there going. You know, God, we're closed. What's going to happen? You know, it was like, hey, we need to be active, proactive, because when it does reopen, it's going to have a little different structure, and we're not going to have the capital we're accustomed to having, and we don't know if people are actually going to be coming back, and we don't know how many, and in what capacity are they going to be to consume? Is You know, what? how do we maintain this? And instead of, you know, maintaining, I think we just recreated. Mm. It's really positive. And we're going to end it right there on a positive note. That is our show for today. You can watch Ingrediente online at video.kpbs.org slash password or anywhere you get the free PBS video app. Port of Entry is hosted by Alan Lilienthal. This episode was written and produced by me, Kinsey Moreland. Emily Jankowski is the co-producer and director of sound design. Elisa Barba is our editor. Lisa Morissette is operations manager. And John Decker is the interim associate general manager of content. This program is made possible in part by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, a private corporation funded by the American people. Thank you so much for listening.